Grimes participated in a debate on the resolution as the sexual revolution failed with three other participants. She took the negative stance on the resolution and I find her opening statement interesting but paradoxical and incoherent. Let's get right into it. Um, okay, I'm not good at reading or public speaking, but let's, and that was really good. So <laughs> Tonight, I argue that the sexual re revolution will be successful. A revolution is a bomb, and violence cannot be a success in and of itself, because violence is a means to an end. But the sexual revolution is incomplete, and therefore much nearer to success than failure. Revol she does not define it or explain its purpose so we could have a clear understanding of it and what to look for as indicators for its success or failure. But other than that, she will take an interesting stance of neither arguing for the affirmative or negative of the resolution, which places her in an undemanding position where she does not have to provide persuasive argumentation for the negative if she were to take a definite stance. The sexual revolution is incomplete. It has neither failed nor succeeded yet, thus we have to continue with it until it does. It is hard to adjudicate this assertion because she has not given us criteria for assessing the progress of the movement in light of its goals which were not defined. Her reasoning for why she thinks the sexual revolution is incomplete is interesting but to be blunt and precise, it's incoherent. Revolutions historically fail when their violent nature becomes their identity but they succeed when an improved culture is rebuilt in their wake. So really bad at reading off a of paper. Like this is an issue all through high school. So, um, uh, <clears throat> we <laughs> we are all rebuilding the culture right now. Uh, this was already said, so, but I'm saying it again. We are four young mothers debating in the public square because we were able to plan our families around our careers. It may not feel novel, but in the grand arc of history, this is a rare luxury. The sexual revolution is both a cultural and a technological phenomenon. Birth control, abortions, hormone therapy, pornography, dating apps, blah, 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 blah. Um, the resulting freedoms, behavioral changes, and psychological impact of these technologies have deeply impacted traditional mating practices. Fertility, re relationships, and marriage have all plummeted, while depression and loneliness are widespread and climbing. This is an indication of what she might think the sexual revolution is, or at least definitionally associated with, that we can think of as something intrinsic to the consequences of the sexual revolution as we process her opening statement and ideas further. But her next sentence, she makes the admission that the sexual revolution is about dismantling sexual mores. The opposition will correctly argue that the dismantling of sexual norms has left us worse off in many ways. But my rebuttal to traditionalists will always be that advancements in technology must always be accompanied by advancements in complementary social technology. Social technologies include religion, currency, manners, law, values, memes, government. Social this is true. I agree with her that technological advancements should be accompanied with advancements in our moral philosophy. The problem with that sagacious insight in this context is that the technological advancements are not the cause of the sexual revolution, but the tool that unshackled what inhibited the expression of the cultural mores, philosophy and understanding on sex, the crowbar used to pry open Pandora's box to what already hid inside. This is where we are introduced to her thinking why the sexual revolution is incomplete but nearer to success than to failure. Her rebuttal consequently lays down the preposition that technological advancements should impact or even define our identity. We should orient ourselves, our existence, our philosophy of existence around the technology and not the other way around, where we use the technology to aid our endeavors and orient it around our identity and values, not us around it. She will make this preposition more clearly with her next couple of sentences. Social technology is analogous to the idea of social engineering. To quote Sam Oberia, it is the intentional design of specific social arrangements and ways of operating. 
Social tech is designed to better climatize our monkey brains and bodies to the tools we're using. If the car is the tech, the collective agreement to wear seatbelts is the complementary social tech. Culture just doesn't just happen to us, it is us. And if it is hurting us, we can redesign it. She is right on her last statement that we are not a slave to culture. It is a tool in service to us and society. She also makes the point that culture is us, our identity. But in our thinking, what should determine culture is our technology. As technology evolves, so does our culture, our identity, which leaves us in an ironic position where instead of us being the slaves of culture, we are now the slaves of technology because we should orient ourselves around technology and technological possibilities instead of our human nature, identity, values and endeavors. As she has said, quote, Social tech is designed to better climatize our monkey brains and bodies to the tools we are using. Close quote. What is more interesting is analyzing her statements within the broader context of her thinking and mind, which is the sexual revolution, the technology, and the culture around it which we need to acclimatize to. This means that it can never fail. There are no criteria for determining if it failed because it is technological advancement, an a priori intrinsic good, therefore we need to climatize to it. It has already been assumed that it's intrinsically a good without an argument. Moments ago in her opening statement, she listed some consequences of the sexual revolution and agreed with the affirmative side of the debate's list of bad outcomes. But her response to that is that our culture should change. We should social engineer society so as to call those outcomes good. Abortion, pornography, the plummeting of fertility relationships and marriage, and the widespread increase of loneliness and depression. We should social engineer society to think that those outcomes are not really bad, but good. I argue that the sexual revolution is a natural and unavoidable stepping stone to the world we all want, a world where everyone is sexually free. With the aid of clever social engineering, many still choose traditional family values because they are just as enticing as the alternative. For this is just a utopian vision buffet that she is expressing, where you can have your cake and eat it too where choices and outcomes are not mutually exclusive, where human happiness is not bracketed by the fixed necessities of biology and psychology. For the better part of the last century, society has already been attempting to live out this utopia experiment, but she has already listed the effects of the sexual revolution on people's lives and society. For example, the technological and social changes of the last 50 years have made intergenerational living socially uncomfortable, which has resulted in a massive loss of wisdom about family building and removed the natural caregivers that would normally help raise their own grandkids. There's no compulsory classes about how to be a good father, mother, or partner in any school that I'm aware of. Uh, no wonder so many people are lost when it comes to forging or maintaining the kinds of relationships required to have a lasting marriage or babies. Similarly, communal tribal style living with like-minded community has totally changed my experience as a mother. Uh, this cultural practice or so te social technology seems obvious, uh, but it's expensive to obtain enough housing for communal living with numerous families. Housing reform and legislation is just one of the puzzle pieces necessary to build the cultural norms we need to undermine the mal effects of modernity and of the sexual revolution. Converse I wonder how could Grimes with her opening statement, argue for the negative side of the resolution with the admission that she just made, quote, we need to undermine the mal effects of modernity and of the sexual revolution, close quote. Her argument is that the sexual revolution is incomplete because we need systems put in place to address the symptoms of the sexual revolution. It's a very paradoxical argument that she is making. If the consequences of the sexual revolutions are bad, then why address the symptoms and not the root cause? Conversely, I know so many people 
who experience great emotional satisfaction from unconventional sex lives, and those behaviors can be traced back to Neolithic human behavior just as readily as monogamy can. There is a difference between momentary euphoria and happiness. Earlier in her opening statement, she said with regards to the sexual revolution, quote, fertility relationships and marriage have all plummeted, while depression and loneliness are widespread and climbing. Close quote. The individuals who say they experience great emotional satisfaction from unconventional sex lives are the same ones who experience the plummet of relationships and rise in loneliness and depression. It's all a matter of time frame. And another thing is that those individuals who do practice unconventional sex lives are the agents that perpetrate and perpetuate the consequences of the sexual revolution to society that she has mentioned. Uh, however, right now, the realm, that realm of sexuality is overweighted in the culture. Our infrastructure makes ch children inconvenient and expensive. Childhood and motherhood are invisible in pop culture. Our education system is crumbling. In my opinion, social engineering a social environment where parenthood is adequately supported and valued is an attainable goal. I suspect this would cascade into uh, less judgment of non-traditional sex lives. The sexual revolution is net good and will succeed if we can get to the finish line. Is my vote. How can she say the sexual revolution is a net good when she has admitted by her own statements that the consequences of the sexual revolution have been bad and her finish line are systems that are meant to alleviate and push back the consequences of the sexual revolution. The biggest threat to the sexual revolution is the value of motherhood and parenthood, concomitantly childhood as well. It is a logical consequence that all three of the groups would be undermined, attacked, and deemed quote-unquote unattainable by a culture and worldview led by the sexual revolution. Her vision is asking for an utopian paradox where the sexual revolution continues with its eradication of sexual mores, but at the same time being without the consequences of a society with no sexual mores. <laughs>